that Japanese gaming consoles are a necessity for gracious living. To a lot of people living in the West throughout the early to mid 90s, the console wars were primarily a two horse race between Nintendo and Sega, with the Sony PlayStation brand changing things by 1995. But as you were likely aware, if you look a little harder it becomes clear pretty quickly that many others were looking for a slice of that sweet console market pie too. As for the 8 and 16-bit console war, this battle for supremacy raged between Sega and Nintendo across most of the world, with them not being successfully challenged. In Japan, on the other hand, we got a different story though. If you know your judo well, sorry, if you know your gaming history well, you will be well aware that this era in time should not really be covered without mentioning the glorious NEC PC Engine, an impressive game console with an amazing CD add-on that, at points, was the best-selling console in Japan. Not only that, but it would also manage to finish second place in the console wars above Sega Systems, making it an especially important piece of hardware over there indeed. It's not surprising really that the console sold as well as it did after all. Upon its time of release, it was competing with Nintendo's popular yet rudimentary 8-bit Famicom. The PC Engine displayed better graphics and more colours than any console in the world at the time, so it was an extremely impressive piece of kit. The PC Engine, its add-ons and many, many variants are hardware that I'd like to cover extensively in the future on this channel, but today we are instead going to be covering its lesser celebrated successor. That's right, in this upload we are going to be spotlighting NEC's fifth generation hardware, falling into the same generation as the likes of the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation. Obviously, this machine is not talked about or praised anywhere close to as much as the PC Engine, so let's try to learn more. I am Lady Decade and this is the story of the PC FX and ultimately why it failed. When it comes to the mid-90s and the fifth generation of gaming, it would be tough to argue a case of the Sony PlayStation not being the undisputed king of the consoles. Slick marketing campaigns, appealing to older demographics of gamers, cheaper hardware than competitors, and a stacked library of games would help elevate the console to become the greatest selling game console of all time up until that point. Not even Nintendo or Sega could compete with Sony's marketing prowess. Sure, the Nintendo 64 and Sega Saturn both made impacts in their own rights, but due to the PlayStation joining the skirmish, neither platform reached the level of success that either company had intended. The console wars had changed forever. If you've been watching this channel for a while or just know gaming history in general for that matter, these three now classic systems were just the beginning within this bat shit crazy generation of hardware. After all, this was the insane era where everyone was creating powerful, often CD-ROM based hardware, which had been designed to try and take the world by storm. We have looked at the rise and dramatic fall of many of these already, including the likes of the real 3DO, the Apple Pippin, the Amiga CD32, the Atari Jaguar and the FM Towns Marty, just to name a few of these beasts. What a crazy period this was. Out of the many who would throw their proverbial hat into the ring as part of this ultimate console battle royale would of course be NEC. To be fair to the company, as discussed earlier in this video, the entity had already had some impressive gaming credentials to its name, with its console hardware finishing second place in Japan in the previous generation. So if any company was capable of producing a Nintendo and Sega challenging piece of hardware, in theory, it could have been them, surely. So push ahead the company would in their effort for console market supremacy. Bringing to us, of course, the PCFX. The NEC PCFX would first see a release in the Japanese market in December of 1994, arriving on the scene at roughly the same time 
as two of the industry's biggest juggernauts of that generation. This new system reached the market just one week after the Sony PlayStation and only about a month after the Saturn, meaning that it would face off against extremely stiff competition from the first moment that it was made available. Whilst previously the PC Engine saw release as the TurboGrafx-16 in North America and simply the TurboGrafx in Europe, the PCFX on the other hand permanently remained exclusive to the Japanese market, with no Western release ever materialising. Why this was the case is up for debate, but it is clear that the previous generation NEC's hardware found substantially a lot more success in Japan than anywhere else. So Japan would seem the most likely place that the PCFX could become a success. This quirky console's aesthetics were certainly different from other home consoles on the market. The case for the console itself had a somewhat of a unique form factor in that it was shaped like a PC tower as opposed to the more traditional console. In fact, like a PC tower, it was planned for the PCFX to be upgradable. However, with its shelf life ultimately being quite limited, this never actually materialised. But before everything went horribly wrong for the console, things did at one point look rather promising. In its early days, the PCFX with its 32-bit system architecture was named Tetsujin or Iron Man. This technology was developed in-house by NEC themselves and was shown off at a large number of different trade shows as early as even 1992, two whole years before the Saturn or the PlayStation would come to the market. In fact, by the summer of that same year, an imminent release for the technology was already being discussed, with many different third-party developers being touted for this PC Engine follow-up system. As discussed previously, the PC Engine was a massive deal in Japan and was, of course, still immensely popular in 1992. If a console is in such a position, from a modern Western viewpoint, you would expect consumer brand loyalty to make customers want to upgrade to the next generation of hardware when it becomes available. However, the situation seemed quite different in Japan back in 1992. Early opinions on what would come to be known as PCFX technology seem to be rather mixed. A trend seemed to be developing whereby a lot of gamers in the region showed a complete lack of interest in the possibility of switching their PC engine to new hardware. It seems that PC engine owners were not craving a more powerful system as the old hardware was already doing a perfect job of satisfying players' needs. This would cause NEC to begin second-guessing their current plan and choosing to stop trying to push for a 1992 or 1993 release of the system. Through this period, NEC would simply choose to offer their consumers base product system add-ons and modifications for their existing PC engines instead. An idea that likely inspired the ridiculousness that is the 32X. Whilst getting the most out of the PC Engine at the time seemed to be the right thing for NEC to do in terms of actual consumer demand, NEC themselves seemed to have grown complacent when it came to looking towards the company's future, as the hardware would not be as impressive in 1994 as it could have been if it had indeed surfaced as early as 1992. The PC FX launch was finally announced at the end of 1993 and, as mentioned previously, launched alongside the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation in 1994. The big problem at this point was that by the time of the release of the PCFX, its specs remained relatively unchanged from the original Iron Man architecture from all the way back in 1992, with the only real difference being the addition of a new 32-bit V810 RISC CPU. The PCFX looked to be in instant trouble. The dated on arrival hardware would be sent into the marketplace to hilariously try to compete with the PlayStation, completely unprepared for the sales massacre it was about to face. Ridiculously, the PCFX would be completely lacking in system capabilities in comparison to both 
the PlayStation and the Saturn, with it not even featuring a Polygon graphics processor, arguably the most important feature that any game console needed to have in that generation. Impressive Polygon graphics quite literally helped to shift consoles during that time. If you feel that there were some strange choices when it came to developing the Sega Saturn's architecture to compete during this generation, then watch whilst NEC picks up their PCFX whilst excitedly screaming, HOLD MY BEER! But was there at least any method to this madness that led to what retrospectively looks like a completely reckless decision? Well, it is said that NEC opted to make the decision to not bother with polygons because, back in 1992, polygon processors were low-powered and only allowed games to be developed featuring blocky graphics. NEC decided that if games were to feature polygons, then they should all be pre-rendered instead anyway. Therefore, including such technology would be a waste of time, money and resources. In many ways, much like Sega of Japan, NEC couldn't really see the merit of pushing Polygon Gaming when games of that archetype had a track record for simply looking ugly and basic at the time. Instead, NEC on the other hand was more focused on pushing the growth of 2D gaming capabilities to its very limits, something Sega of Japan intended to do with the Sega Saturn at 1.2, before their plans came crashing down. So. If the PCFX was not good with polygons, was it at least okay with other stuff? Well, technically yes. The PCFX was engineered to feature the ability to decompress 30 JPEG pictures per second, whilst simultaneously playing digitally recorded audio. Overall, this would mean that the PCFX was the most powerful platform on the market when it came to its ability to display full motion videos, with no other system of that generation surpassing the PCFX in that regard. Essentially, NEC had decided to build a 2D powerhouse that was the master of full motion video, perhaps the most 1992 plan that could have ever been conceived. However, the system wasn't released in bloody 1992, it came out in bloody 1994. No wonder it was met with such instant hardship, but regardless of this, NEC still had some sort of plan to make this machine some kind of success. Marketing-wise, the bold plan for the PCFX was for NEC to target audiences who were five years older than the average PC engine owner. This was done to expand their audience whilst hoping that PC Engine owners by this point would already be familiar with the company's products and would naturally want to upgrade their hardware anyway. Regarding this failed platform, apparently a global release for the PCFX was ruled out very early on, partially on the basis that NEC did not believe that Westerners were particularly interested in expensive consoles, especially if they did not feature additional non-gaming uses. But let's be honest, after the lacklustre performance of the Turbo Graphics and the demand for the PlayStation in the West, it's kind of obvious that the PCFX would not have stood a chance to begin with in the first place anyway, so they were probably right to not even try in my opinion. So, with the focus solely on Japan, what would be concocted to make this somehow a success? NEC would end up ordering Hudson Soft to only develop games based on well-known anime franchises for the system, all of which use pre-rendered animated footage. Whilst this obviously played to the system's full motion video strengths, this sadly, foolishly stopped Hudson from bringing their highly successful PC Engine IPs to the platform, such as Bonk and Bomberman, which retrospectively was a ridiculously foolish move. Ultimately, after this series of clearly poorly executed moves by NEC, the PCFX was completely discontinued by 1998, selling a pitiful 400,000 units over a space of four years. During this period, only 62 games saw a release on the platform, with the final game seeing release in April of 1998. If you fancy importing one of these devices today, fortunately the PCFX features no 
copy protection. So you can experience all of the system's now defunct games. And well, these games are much like the FM Towns Marty, which we covered previously on this channel. Many of these titles are apparently weird, adult-only Japanese hentai games. Tentacles and spiky robot dicks, anyone? Yes, that's right. It was another one of those consoles that resorted to lewds. I guess if you cannot compete with Sega and Sony, then target the perverts. The PC FX is essentially the poster child on how to not make a fifth generation game console, with it being extremely easy to decode as to why this one failed. Maybe if it had arrived earlier, back in 1992, it could have sold potentially a little bit better, but based on the market research for the time, I wouldn't hold my breath in that scenario either. When looking at the history of this console, its weak software lineup and lack of innovation and creativity from NEC, it becomes truly clear that this was a rather silly console. So I am Lady Decade and that was the story of the PC FX. Now if you enjoyed this video then like, subscribe, hit that notification bell and leave me a comment down below and as is usual at the end of my videos I like to answer a question from my patrons. So today's question is from Sebastian Velez and he asks, do you ever feel that you'll be as bougie as me? And the answer is no Sebastian, you know for a fact, you know for a fact that I will never ever be as bougie as you. You are the Viscount of Vavavoom, the Duke of Bougie and ultimate, just, I just, I just love you. I just do. I love you. So Sebastian Velez, one of the things that makes him particularly bougie and one of my favourite gamers on the planet is he has a rather impressive collection, a mwah, collection of working design stuff. So the thing is with working designs is they translated Japanese games, so games that were mainstream in Japan but basically weren't uh, weren't released outside. Um, they translated them and then released them to a North American audience. So the only working designs game I've got is this, which I picked up when I was travelling America in 2016. This is the only one I've got. That's it. And um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to show you a quick reel of the pictures of Sebastian's very obscure sort of very exclusive collection which was given to him by someone who actually had dealings with working designs so it would not surprise me if he has stuff in amongst this that no one else has unless they worked for working designs so here you go